Hi, everyone, and welcome back to the Co-Management Commons podcast. I'm pretty excited to share this one today with uh, Dr. Fikrit Berkus. And uh, for people that are involved in co-management, I'm sure at some point you've definitely have read one of his papers or from one of his students. He's certainly has been extremely influential in the field of co-management and his experience both in Canada and internationally is very well renowned. And in particular, he was witness to the first co-management agreements that happened in Canada in Quebec in the early 1970s. So I was really happy to catch up with him in his home in Manitoba and we had a great chat and I hope that uh, we'll get to connect again sometime because he's certainly a wealth of knowledge and I hope you will appreciate this particular podcast and all that he had to offer. So enjoy. You are listening to the Co-Management Commons podcast. Thank you for learning about shared decision making around valuable fish and wildlife species with Indigenous peoples in Canada. Let's all care about honoring the spirit and intent of Indigenous rights, treaties, and land claim agreements. Thank you for listening. Welcome, Dr. Burgess, to the Co-Management Commons podcast. And I just want to say it's an absolute honor to have you with us today. I thank you for all your renowned and groundbreaking work on the Commons and community-based resource management, sustainability, sacred ecology, and integrating traditional knowledge into resource management. And really happy to see your most recent publication in a Creative Commons license so more people can get to see uh, a lot of your writings over your career. And to dive right into our conversation, why don't we start going right back to to some of the beginnings, I guess, where your work has spanned several decades. And I know you witnessed the first co-management agreements that came into effect as a result of land claim agreements. So I'd love to hear your reflections and stories on that time and and what you think listeners should know about that time in our history. Thanks, Jamie, for having me. you, You have a really good very interesting collection of uh, podcasts. I, I heard a few. <laughs> I also know you're a scholar in co-management yourself. I just recently cited your uh, your 2022 paper about about the uh, the Labrador commercial fisheries and signing co-management or or rather signing agreements with co-management in it by itself is not a solution. <clears throat> I guess that's one of the things that I learned over the years. My Experience with co-management goes back to the 1990s, so we are talking ancient history here. This was shortly after I finished my PhD. I did a year of teaching, and then I was working <clears throat> with the Cree. The, the Cree of Quebec signed the James Bay Northern Quebec Agreement in 1975. And the agreement, as I think all the subsequent agreements as well, had a chapter on co-management, but the word co-management did not exist back in the 70s. Uh, technically, the committee was called Committee Conjoint, the, the French being the, uh, the official language, Joint Committee, which sort of expresses the idea that there's some joint decision-making going on, but but not quite <clears throat> the, the, the idea of co-management as it later developed. So at that point, I, I had been working with the Cree, and I, I was familiar with much of their hunting, fishing. I'm, I'm more of a fisheries guy, so I, I started with the Cree, looking at the impacts of the, the, the big James Bay Hydro Project, the Lagrand Project. And I was looking at the, the impact of the Hydro Project on the fisheries. And over a postdoc year, I became more interested in the, the fishermen than the fish. So I I sort of switched from more of a natural science approach to a social science approach, but neither of them, probably neither of them very well, because um, ecologists no longer consider me an ecologist, and anthropologists never really 
accepted me as an anthropologist anyway. So I'm I'm one of these strange fish, or I should say neither fish nor fowl kind of thing. But you know, it served me well. I enjoy being in that kind of a position. So so here I was with the Cree, and uh, I was an advisor, fairly minor because I was rather junior. But I found myself going to co-management meetings. <clears throat> the meetings following the James Bay Agreement had the federal government, the provincial government, the Cree, and the Inuit, Northern Quebec Inuit, not the Labrador, plus the Nascapi as observers, because their agreement was coming up next. Actually, it did come up in 78. It was really very interesting because it, the, the committee was doing things that I, I never thought was possible. So you had the federal, provincial, and, and indigenous representatives talking to one another. It was some very interesting dynamics. And uh, now, that wasn't the very first co-management committee. The, the very first one was the Beverly Kaminuria Caribou Management Board in the Northwest Territories. But it, it wasn't a legal agreement. In other words, it didn't have the legal backing of a, of a native claims agreement. And it was set up because the federal managers thought it would be a good idea to educate the Inuit so they wouldn't overhunt the carrier. Well, it actually turned out that the Inuit educated the federal biologists and not the other way around. But that, that's a whole different story, which a, a PhD student of mine did a whole thesis on it. So here I was in this very interesting committee, not not knowing or saying very much, but learning and observing a lot. And I'll mention one story. We were in Fort Chaimo, Kujuak. The names have changed, as you know, over the years. And the government people, uh, actually the spokesman was a provincial spokesperson, but it was a sort of a joint federal provincial position that the Inuit were overhunting the polar bear <clears throat> because the polar bear count was down. And the, the biologists took these numbers actually very seriously. Uh, and they said, look, the, the numbers are down. So the Inuit representative said, what, what, what's it based on? And uh, the government people said, well, it's based on counts. The Inuit said exactly where. They said Davis, Davis Strait. Now, that's the strait between the Quebec Labrador Peninsula and Baffin Island, and it's ice-free, I think, more or less the whole year. At least these days with climate change, definitely is ice-free. The Inuit said, well, you realize there's no ice there at the time you did the surveys. So how did you count the polar bears? And they said, well, you know, we, we counted what we could see, obviously. And the Inuit said, well, polar bears have a very small head. And if you have a polar bear in the water, you're not going to get an accurate count. And that more or less ended the uh, the exchange because <clears throat> the government people were taking the numbers very seriously, but the numbers for a polar bear hunter were not meaningful because they were clearly underestimates. So now you're basing a potential conservation measure, meaning banning of hunting, uh, and basing it on rather flimsy kind of evidence. And this was not just cool, but it was also unusual in, in that that kind of exchange and the, and the fact that this co-management committee brought together the parties where they could actually uh, talk to one another. I'm not using the word cross-examining, but that's what really ended up. And the cross-examining showed the flaw in the measure being proposed. So it was like that. As far as I remember, there was no polar bear ban, and there hasn't been one. But it, it also revealed the idea that you can do surveys, caribou, polar bear, belugas, and the surveys may have missed something. And yet in the North, governments really enforced it until these co-management agreements happened. Just just harking back to the, the Beverly Kaminuri I care with, these are two herds on the west side of Hudson Bay, and they sort of intermix. And it turned out that, in fact, the counts had missed some change in range of the caribou and not, not overhunting by the Inuit. And that also came up. 
Milton Freeman at University of Alberta wrote a, a book chapter on that. So it's actually very well documented. So the co-management wasn't just a legal forum and negotiation forum, but it also helped clarify what the agreements were really trying to accomplish. In other words, give a voice to the native parties. Yeah, no, I really appreciate you uh, sharing the polar bear story just because in my own work in co-management, our three co-management boards do our best to collaborate in recent years about population in the Davis Strait area. But also interesting to reflect and think that the discussions are still very similar today as they were back in the early 90s. But uh, one interesting thing that I thought about as you were talking was in the Quebec area of Nunavik, it is the one area where there isn't actually a quota system in place right now. And I wonder if some of that dates back to maybe being involved in co-management from the early beginnings because they I know in all of the forums that I've been in, they definitely make very strong arguments about uh, water doesn't need to be one and things are, are being handled fine the way they are. And, and that whole conversation creates a lot of debate, but it's interesting that Quebec is one of the very few places right now that still doesn't have a polar bear quota in the Davis Strait area, at least. I also appreciate your comment about uh, citing an article. Thank you for that. I certainly know that me and many, many others have uh, cited a lot of your work and, and your your research has been so influential in the co-management field and certainly provides a lot of the foundational thinking, I would suggest, in this area. And just wondering if you could talk about how your perspectives and approaches may have evolved as you've witnessed more and more co-management agreements come to fruition since the James Bay example? Um, yeah, the, uh, of course, the big development since the 70s is that the whole North is covered in, in land use agreements. The James Bay Agreement of 75 was really the first one before any of the real Northern ones. And uh, the Nunavut Agreement, what came in in 1993, the the Inuvialuit Agreement, which is the Western Arctic, actually was before that, uh, 1984. Um, and like the Labrador one, they have multiple co-management bodies. I think they have four. The Western Arctic one has one just for fish and and marine mammals, for example, and that's the committee that I'm most familiar with. And it's probably the one committee that actually works very well. Some of my statements may be dated, maybe they've had some bad turns, but they did some pretty good work with the char and uh, some of the other fisheries, and they really talk to one another. Uh, and in this case, it's mostly the, the feds and, and, and one indigenous group, the, the Inuvialuit, the, the Western Arctic Inuit. The one thing I, I learned from that particular agreement is that key people are very important. You can have somebody who can be the lubrication between two or more parties, or if you're missing that kind of leadership, the agreement doesn't work. A retired federal civil servant from Fisheries and Oceans Canada is the key person in the case of the Inuvialuit Agreement. I, I, I don't know if he has retired a second time since then, but he really made it work. He was a good listener, unlike most government managers and biologists, and, uh, and the Inuit really appreciated that. And he was also very knowledgeable, which the Inuit appreciated even more. But leadership can be done in different ways. In the case of the James Bay Agreement, the initial chair was a federal rep. Uh, the second chair was a Cree, Philip Awashish, who later became the chief at Mistassini. Philip said, we're going to do something different. We're going to make decisions on a consensus basis, which is what indigenous people do. Up until then, under the federal chair, we were voting on things. With Philip as the chair, we did it the indigenous way, which was very slow. You talk and you talk and you talk. And consensus doesn't mean everybody has to agree. It means that many people agree and the others are willing to go along. 
but not objecting. That was new to all of us, including me, even though I had been around with the Cree for a while. But, you know, I didn't really think it would work. And, and some of the reps really complained. They said, this is too slow. But the chair stuck with it. And, uh, <clears throat> and the decisions made under that rule actually worked, although there weren't that many decisions. The third chair was a Quebec rep. And he went back to the to the majority voting method. And we passed a lot of resolutions, most of which did not go through for various reasons. Uh, so that that was a big lesson for me, that maybe there was something in the indigenous approach that actually was superior to our time-tested voting procedures. Voting procedures means that the, the minority are left out. But under a consensus kind decision-making, the minority are at least satisfied to the extent that they are willing to go along. So that that's an important distinction in a democracy like Canada, where you know there are a lot of minorities, religious minorities, ethnic minorities, economic minorities, I think that's a really uh, interesting observation and uh, it makes me think about how when the Labrador Inuit land claim agreement came along it was stated right in there that the board meetings had to be done by consensus and I wonder if some of that was influenced by those earlier land claim agreements and seeing how they worked and what some of the pros and cons might have been. So that, that was really interesting to hear that. And there's no doubt, I know you were saying earlier, some maybe thoughts are data, but we both know that things change a lot. And in some of those earlier days, there no doubt would have been challenges with implementing co-management. Maybe we could just touch on some of those and what you observed as some of the key challenges not only in the early period, but maybe what some of the persistent ones have been. Because it's, I yeah. think it's fair to say there's a balanced uh, debate out there about co-management and what some of the pros and cons are, for sure. Well, they're, they're systemic challenges and they're practical challenges. I'll mention a practical one, terminology. It takes, a, it takes quite an effort to get the parties to speak the same language. Resource management language is sort of obscure, except for the uh, the those in the know. It's a bit like your, your doctor writing your, your medicines. Only doctors and pharmacists can read it. I've, I've tried to read them, and I can't read them. Uh, and of course, lawyers do something very similar. Um, when they talk legalese, nobody could figure out. Again, I thought I was familiar enough with that kind of language, which of course is the common language in most government decisions and most government laws. But in resource management, you really have to really talk to get that common language going. Uh, my recent experience, just a couple of weeks ago in a workshop we had on knowledge co-production, which is uh, using indigenous knowledge along with science. And I mentioned in, in my talk, I, I mentioned it as a major problem and all the indigenous representatives were nodding and smiling. And the federal representatives, this is not a co-management meeting, just a workshop, but the federal representatives seemed very puzzled that there would be that kind of a problem. The fact that they were puzzled itself is very telling, of course, because the, the indigenous reps really knew that was a problem. Many of the government people did not. I'm sure some of them did, but many of them did not. Uh, so we, we have that gap. And that, of course, carries through to all the co-management and basically all the public participation in, in more general terms. I mean, co-management is a form of participatory decision-making, form of public participation. And, and yet people who should know better don't seem to. Uh, now, you, you did mention these agreements may have learned from one another. That's true. Indigenous leaders talk to one another. Many government people do not. Part of the reason is that there is so much compartmentalization and people change. They move on to other things. In the James Bay Agreement, during the years that I was with the committee, the indigenous reps did not change very much. 
some might be away, somebody else may take their position for a while, but they, they were pretty stable. Not so the government people. They were changing. And of course, each new person coming in meant a whole new learning curve for them. So I think that's one of the challenges of co-management committees, how to keep them stable so that they can learn and move on, move along and develop a personal relationship because uh, the, the the personalities are important in these committees. I, I mentioned the importance of leadership, but it's more than that. Indigenous people prefer to have a personal relationship rather than a legal relationship. Uh, and the government people are usually not oriented that way. So there's a bit of a mismatch. But I'll give you a, a, an example of Indigenous leaders learning from one another, talking to one another. And this is an example that goes right into the international. I was invited by the Sami of Northern Norway to open their yearly meeting, which is a small conference, a couple of hundred people at most, not even more like a hundred something. And the Sami leader, this is 2008, so this is a while ago. And the Sami leader, and, and their English is pretty good. They're, he was speaking in English, and he was using some of the same phrases that I've heard from Canadian indigenous leaders like Matthew Kuhncom, the, the Cree, who was uh, a very influential uh, leader of the Grand Council of the Crees. So afterwards, I talked to the Sami leader, and I said, is this a coincidence or what? And he laughed and he said, we've been talking. We're using the Canadian experience. So the act that established the Sami homeland in northern Norway is actually patterned after the James Bay Northern Quebec Agreement. It doesn't say that anywhere, but that's how it worked. And uh, so this was really a revelation. And even more so, in that meeting, I ran into a, a young woman who said, hey, I'm the only other Canadian here. And I said, oh, yeah, okay, I'm Fikret Berkis, and, and you are. And then she was a Richardson. I said, Richardson from British Columbia, are you related to the Richardsons? He said, yeah, yeah, so-and-so is my dad. So not only they're talking to one another, but they're sending their young people to learn from one another and to establish personal relationships. That's amazing. And of course, government people have no idea. You know, we talk about north-south interactions. Well, they got north-north going, and they have been, they've got it going for a long time. I'm just wondering, some of your Labrador Inuit people, what kind of relations they have? I bet they do have a lot. Yeah, there's definitely a, a network of co-management boards and committees and councils, as you know, right across the north. And one of the things that I'm hoping we can do more of in the future is enhance that north-to-north -north communication. And oddly enough, if there's if there's something that good came out of the pandemic, I feel like we do talk a little bit more now that virtual technologies have become so common, whereas before with geography and the cost of travel, things could be really complicated. But I'm, I'm really interested in your points about the, the Sami example, because I knew your knowledge expanded well beyond the Canadian examples. And you do have this co-management experience all around the world. And I'm kind of curious how Canada fares in comparison to other countries where co-management is also in place. So are there any lessons from other places you've worked that could strengthen co-management in Canada, or maybe we're the leader in. I'm kind of really curious to hear your thoughts on that. Well, yeah, we've already mentioned that there's a lot of learning that goes around, but maybe not enough from the government side. Canada, no doubt, is one of the world leaders in co-management. You, you can, well, you know that from, from your own citations your, in your co-management papers that there's a lot of Canadian examples going on. Um, the U U.S. lags behind simply because they don't have any modern indigenous land claims agreements. Uh, but in fact, the word co-management comes from the 70s, from the decision of Judge Bolt. This is the Pacific Salmon co-management, um, where the tribes of the Pacific Northwest, that's Oregon and Washington, they, they sued the U.S. government. They said, we are supposed to have 50% of the catch of the salmon, but we're not getting it. 
because all the fleets, offshore fleets, catch the salmon before they come in. So we, we don't even have a chance at the salmon. And after long court case, the judge, Bolt, so it's known as the Bolt decision, said, well, you know, for the coal management, they should have 50% of the salmon and to have 50% of the salmon, they should be on management boards that manage not just the inshore salmon catch, but inshore and offshore, the whole stock. So there, there is a very important U.S. precedent, but basically there isn't a lot of uh, coal management in the U.S., not, not legally back backed. There is practical coal management, such as use of wetlands and so on. There's a, there's a big literature on that, but with indigenous coal management, you, you do, do need the legal backing, as you know, because they're fragile, right? Uh, indigenous rights are, are much too easy to take away or not to enforce or to ignore or wh whatever. And the uh, and U.S. just doesn't have that. The two countries that have it are Australia and New Zealand, plus the, the Norway Sami I mentioned. That. That's a pretty good agreement they have there. Um, I, I like the Australian protected areas provisions. They have major co-management with protected areas. Uh, they have native guardians. We call them guardians. In Australia, they call them rangers. Okay, o Australia, in these indigenous-led protected areas, there are basically indigenous rangers who are in charge. The, the one innovation that Australia has successfully made, and I think we're trying to copy, but we're not, I'm not quite sure how, how far, is that there's a lot of indigenous land in Australia, and many of these have become protected areas. So it's a, it's a good part of the Australian protected area system. But it's the indigenous people who make the decision on, on whether there would be coal management or not, and whether that area should become a protected area or not. They can say no. And then they, they, they do their own business. Or they can say yes. And the incentives are then they get help and they get they get training, development, they get jobs out of it because they're rangers and so on. But it's it's a very successful system and it's a huge network. Now in, in Canada, as you know, we're trying to reach the 3030 the 30-30 target, 30% 30 of all lands and waters by the year 2030. And and we're way below that. So how are you going to reach the 30? Well, in the case of Manitoba, I live in Winnipeg, so I'm talking Manitoba. You can add the Labrador experience. The, the protected lands under protected area status, the terrestrial land under protected area status, only 11%. And the only way we can get to 30 is to get indigenous-led protected areas. Now, one of them is the, the Seal River catchment, which is the biggest undeveloped catchment uh, in Manitoba as well as in Quebec. All the major rivers are dammed. Seal River is the only one left that's not dammed. So it's it's actually very uh, relatively natural uh, with a mix of tundra and, um, and and boreal forest, the taiga really sort of not open, open crown forest, not a big forest left like we know. Um, that Seal River is 8%, just by itself, 8% of Manitoba. So this indigenous-led protected area is fairly advanced now. So it has the potential of, of jumping that 11% protected area to 11 plus 8, 19%. So it's, as in Australia, the, the indigenous-led conservation areas are are going to be the key in Canada to reach the target, if Canada is ever going to reach the target. And uh, I see a big future for Indigenous-led protected areas, which are going to be really with Indigenous people in charge. But they're going to be co-management because the government isn't giving up on the lands. The, these are still largely crown lands. So it's going to be co-management with, with not just Indigenous participation, but Indigenous leadership. The president was in BC, the Guayanas, the first co-managed national park. I don't know if it preceded the Australian ones or not, but it's fairly early. But government didn't really like that because you're giving away powers, right? And nobody wants to give away powers. And, you know, basically the Indigenous people are managing it the best way they see fit. 
And as far as I know, it's working actually quite well. It started way back when there was a controversy over clear cutting of, uh, of old growth forests on these, these islands of British Columbia. But you did ask me about international, so I'll, I'll tell you an international co management story. We were, I, I'm, I, I work in the area of commons and uh, we have an association sometimes. We send people to do training sessions in various countries. So uh, on this occasion, I found myself in Mozambique. In uh, Mozambique is a fairly large country, not low population density, big, big coastline. You see it in the news when a, when a hurricane hits every now and then. So we did work on common score management with people from the forestry sector, fishery sector, and so on. Uh, mostly land. I think I was the only fish type person. No, myself and Bonnie McKay. The, the fisheries people in the workshop, they said, you know, this is really interesting and important stuff. And our coastal fishers are suffering from foreign fleets coming in, trolling right through their nets. They said, do you mind if we organize a meeting between you and our, our equivalent of deputy minister for fisheries so you can talk co-management? And I said, sure, love that. So a couple of days later, I'm sitting in the office of the deputy minister. It's, it's part of the Ministry of Agriculture, so it's not a big division under the agriculture, but it's still fairly important <clears throat> because it turns out they make money from the offshore fleets. They give fishing rights, and then they really don't monitor it. And who gets the cost? The inshore fishery of small-scale fishers. So I said, you know I, why I'm here to talk co-management? And she said, yeah, it was a fairly young woman who had pretty good English. It's a former Portuguese colony, so she spoke the local language, Portuguese, and pretty good English. She she certainly was no dummy, and she was not a political appointment. I mean, she, she knew her stuff. So after some back and forth, I said, well, what do you think about co-management? She said, not much. I said, why not? And she pushed this huge tome. She said, this is, <laughs> is the lawyer's report. We said, we are thinking co-management. What are the implications? What are the legal implications and what do you recommend? Well, the gist of it was that the lawyer said, under no circumstances, governments should give away their powers. Who are the co-managers anyway? Bunch of illiterate fishermen. Why would you want to co-manage? We're making money out of the these foreign fleets, mostly Spanish. Um, so we take the costs and we take the money. Uh, well, it may, the report may not have said all that, but that was the implication. So basically, we got nowhere with co-management in Mozambique. So that, I think, is the reality for a lot of countries. On the other hand, there has been very good co-management in other places like Philippines. So it's a puzzle, you know, why it works in some places and why not others. Right now, I'm working with the FAO, the United Nations <laughs> Food and Agricultural Organization, and we're doing a book on small-scale fisheries and how to protect them around the world. Home management is one of the chapters. There, there's a chapter on commons and followed by a chapter on co management. That's where I'm citing your paper, by the way, that that having an agreement is no guarantee that it's going to work. Yeah, I remember that quote pretty clearly because when the fisherman here in Labrador said he was certainly reflecting on a decade of trying to implement the land claim agreement and still a lot of work and no guarantee, but it, at least it gets you at the table and a leg up. And all of those examples were so uh, fascinating. And just last week, there was some news out of Labrador that the Nazi government and the government of Canada are looking to sign an indigenous marine protected area. So along the lines of what you were saying of trying to do their part over here on the East Coast. And I'm really interested to do a little bit of research after and learn more about the Seal River because I'm not familiar with that area. But the fact that it's not dammed, as you say, is a bit of a rare situation in a lot of cases where there has been hydroelectric power uh, in Canada, no doubt. One of the other things I was really hoping to chat about today was all of the different dialogues that we've been a part of about integrating 
knowledge, indigenous knowledge, and scientific approaches. And your book, The Sacred Ecology, is obviously a a must read for people working in this area, I feel. It was one of the first books I got introduced to when I started working in this area. And that book was very powerful and a moving contribution. And I, I just wonder if there's examples that uh, stick out in your mind where the integration of science and indigenous science led to better ecological outcomes or any sort of stories that could help make that point for people because I think it's going to be an ongoing discussion for many years to come still because not everyone has still come to grips with the benefits of both. What are your thoughts on that? Yes, yes, thanks. Yeah. Well, I've been interested in Indigenous knowledge starting in the 70s when I went into the field and realized how knowledgeable people really were about their environment. And then I came across some interesting, very early cases of that kind of knowledge, combination knowledge integration. And and one was when the Cree representatives asked the provincial people who did aerial surveys, the issue was setting beaver quotas before the beaver market collapsed because of EU regulations, you know, back in what, late 70s, early 80s? I think early 80s. Anyway, the Cree said, can we have access to your, we want to learn from your aerial surveys. Would you share the results? I was surprised because from what I knew, they didn't think much of the province's beaver surveys. So afterwards, I asked them, I, I said, you know, you're the experts on beaver. So like, why why did you ask for that? And they said, we have the underground information. We know the lodges. We know which are empty lodges, which are full lodges. So the meaning some of the the beaver houses have no beaver in them, right? So you can't include them when you make a quota. And the 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 Cree always set their own quota anyway. They said we have the underground information, but we don't we can't cover the whole area. So the aerial survey will will tell us the overall picture on how many lodges there are. And then we can do a better job of figuring out what percentage are occupied, what percentage are not, and then set a quota that way. So this was, you know, back in the 70s, it was the Cree were already thinking about combining knowledge and the advantages of that. One being the the long-term underground knowledge versus the one-shot aerial survey with photos and you know they did have a good system of taking photos it's that kind of combination of knowledge Uh, i don't use the word integration because that implies that you take two kinds of knowledge and somehow you mush them together i'm not keen about that because as you know when that happens there's a power difference so the indigenous knowledge is always treated as the weak sister or the weak brother i instead i talk more about bridging knowledge that the two go in parallel but they share as they move along but they would interact and and share information so that's a good analogy a good time to think through so over the years knowledge integration became knowledge co-production and then the word co-production became wider so you co-produce not just knowledge but you can co-produce other things And that's actually the area that I'm working on right now, that knowledge co-production idea. And a recent example of that, again, we're going off fisheries here. The workshop I I had at Brandon University in Manitoba, we were talking about climate change impacts. And the big one over the last year is the wildfires, right? So I decided to use that as the main example for knowledge co-production. I said, the government has a system, fine. Although it doesn't, if you look at the amount of area burned, it it didn't work all that well, except they they saved the yellow knife, but that's fine. Uh, I said, but there's also an indigenous knowledge of forest fires because people know how to burn. Now, they didn't use that knowledge to fight wildfires, but they use that knowledge to improve habitat for moose, for waterfowl, etc. And that knowledge still exists, but it's sort of gone underground because burning forest became illegal after the Smokey the Bear, again, U.S. influence here, Smokey the Bear campaigns made burning illegal. So people who used to burn no longer 
did, or at least they didn't talk about it. It's very well documented in the work by a number of anthropologists, in particular, a University of Alberta anthropologist, Hank Lewis, documented it in northern Alberta, northern California, went to Australia, looked at use of fire, documented that, and then found commonalities among them. So there is that knowledge, and I'm pretty sure some of it still exists, but probably not as much as the time Hank Lewis documented it. So I mentioned all that, and the indigenous reps thought that was a really good example. So what you would do is you would do some local fire planning, meaning basically build resilience. So you build fire breaks, etc. You know, like we're talking resilience building, which is my other area. But the government people look blank. They really look blank. And all they could talk about was emergency planning. So you have a fire and you move people out. And I was saying, but there are things you can do before you have the fire and you move people out. You can do things to avoid it. And to avoid it, you can use local knowledge, local planning, combine the knowledge. And I had a lot of trouble getting through. So that's, it's a bit like, well, this is co-management as well, right? So this is knowledge co-production as part of co-management. And I, I see this whole thing as, as one big ball of wax, which is, can you as government talk to indigenous people? Can you make decisions together, co-management? Can you combine knowledge? And that's knowledge co-production. And there's some very practical reasons for it like wildfire management. And if you can do that, then you get community empowerment. You get people on the ground making part of the decisions, make, are becoming part of the decision making. So reconciliation to me isn't just throwing money at problems, throwing money at people and saying nice things and, and apologizing. It's, it's about talking to people in a way that you can both learn from one another. So that's, uh, to me, the bigger angle of co-management. I really appreciate the example uh, you gave, and I appreciate the nuance of the different language between integrating and bridging, because I think we share uh, maybe a pet peeve in, in common. I've often been in debates where I've been arguing against the word integration and try to make the case, well, why can't we just accept uh, indigenous knowledge for what it is and, and use it for what it is because there's often times in some co-management examples that we've had to deal with where it could be that's the only knowledge that we have So, and people want to put it to use so it shouldn't be that we didn't have to wait until science comes along because Lots of times science doesn't happen in some of these rural and indigenous communities. The other part that I really liked about your story is that sometimes I think it gets perceived that indigenous people don't appreciate the science, which I think is untrue. Like they do want to see the science and be engaged in it and see all of those different perspectives. So those were really great points that resonated with me. and. One of the things that I'm a little bit surprised some days that I'm still working in co-management, and I think somewhere along the way, I had this realization that the thing that uh, kept me really happy at work was that I'm always learning. There's such a diversity of species and situations and so on. And, and this is leading me to my question about the whole idea of co-management organizations being adaptive and learning institutions. I wonder if you could help articulate that for people of a scenario that just illustrates that cycle of how co-management situations can provide feedback loops and learning and really become effective that way. Well, yeah, those, those are the bigger questions. But I mean, obviously, co-management is a good thing. Whether we're doing a really good job with it depends on the case, depends on the situation. Co-management is a process rather than a, an end, end product. So it, it, it's, it's hard to look at concrete results. It's like democracy. We can't say, okay, now we got democracy. Or it's like sustainability. Okay, it's sustainable right now. Well, it may be sustainable today, but it may not be sustainable in a month. So co-management is similar. You can set up a process 
the process should include learning, and that's where you get the learning institutions. That's why you need stability from the government side, not just the indigenous side, so that there's continuous learning, which results in adaptive management, adaptive co-management, that you learn from the experience and you plug it into the to the next cycle, next experience. Um, but it still may not work. You might have a co-management situation that works well. It looks like Seal River is, is on the way to be working, but it may not. It may fall apart in a month. It's very difficult to forecast, but also it's not a reason to give up on it. The whole notion of adaptive co-management, and we did do a book on this with Derek Armitage taking the lead, uh, Nancy Doubleday and myself, and uh, we, we looked at various examples, again, mostly Canadian, but not all of them. To me, the, the adaptive co-management is co-management where you carry forward your experiences. It's learning by doing. And uh, that's what has worked in the Inuvialuit Agreement with the uh, the Fisheries Joint Management Committee. Um, in the James Bay Agreement, I'm not, I'm not so sure. There were so many differences between the Cree and, and the Quebec parties that it often ended up in the courts. The Cree would say, okay, we give up on this. This is not working, but we have rights, so we're going to go to the courts. Uh, I, I hope Labrador doesn't go that way, but more towards the, the Inuvialuit Agreement where you where you can plug in your knowledge and, and you've got reasonable people that the Inuit can talk to on the government side and move on from that. It is a battle. I, I tell my students, I say, if you're working on resource management, especially if you're working on things like co-management, you'll never be out of work. There'll be yeah. always problems to deal with. No, I think that's a very fair statement to share with them for sure. <laughs> Just uh follow up on your Labrador comment. I think so far it has been the case that there hasn't been any court cases or anything related to co-management. Recently in Quebec, there's been a new one in, in relation to the South Hudson Bay polar bear population and a decision that got overturned there. And that has then led to a lot of discussion and debate about whether court cases are the right way to go or not. And uh, I really appreciate you sharing your thoughts on that as well. And one of the things I guess Canada is known for is its democracy. And I just, uh, I know you've written about this. I don't know if you want to make a comment about your thoughts on co-management, public participation, and how you feel the, the two connect there in that regard. Well, when we started on co-management in one of those papers written in the 1990s. The model I used by it was city planning, the famous Arnstein ladder, which is a ladder of public participation in city planning. Same applies to co-management of wildlife or fisheries or polar bears or whatnot. I think the bigger issue is that governments can become too remote. They do need the local input. And uh, if it's resource management, if it's climate change, they, they really do need that local input because it's the fishers, the farmers, the hunters, the bird watchers who are the, the, the people who have their feet on the, on the ground. So co-management in, in its wider sense is, is public participation for better decision making. We're in these very unusual times and unprecedented level of change thanks to climate change but also other things like loss of biodiversity we have not done a good job with climate change or loss of biodiversity as well as some of the other environmental problems so we need new approaches and one of these new approaches is to take local and indigenous knowledge seriously and try to make better decisions using that knowledge uh, so that's common sense. And yet th there is resistance because of knowledge keepers, because of uh, gatekeepers of knowledge uh, on the government side. But then there are some really good people on the government side. So what we've done is you look for people on the government side who are like-minded because there are some people whose minds will never change. But there are others we can work with. 
and then they just hang on till the new generation comes in. So I have a lot more faith in the new generation of uh, resource managers coming in than the old generation who are steeped in the knowledge of believing in hard numbers and believing that there's no such thing as uncertainty when you do a caribou survey. There's a lot of uncertainty and we need people who know that, just as the Inuit themselves know that. So that's also part of, in the Canadian case, that's also part of reconciliation, giving more power to communities and to people who are knowledgeable, knowing, of course, there's still problems because Indigenous people are less and less on the land, and, and we we found that out when we did a CCA re- report. We we did one looking at food security, and it, it really looked like the North is in trouble in terms of boots on the land, but also getting food from the land. So uh, more co-management, more local controls, more local self-confidence is is going to reverse some of that trends yeah no that's a really really nice point and that's something the co-management board that i work with it's something that they've started to prioritize in recent years because of exactly what you're saying this risk to cultural continuity so whereas in the earlier days we might have been prioritizing natural sciences and then it transitioned to prioritizing Inuit knowledge studies. And now it seems like we're starting to transition to stewardship and education work and bringing youth and elders out onto the caribou grounds and trying to keep people connected because ever since the caribou hunting ban that was put in place here about 10 years ago now, a lot of young people are not getting to see their first caribou and not only what some of us would see as young people but people in their 20s and 30s and onwards so there's starting to be a real risk there and uh, definitely a big priority and i also like your comment about the new generation i'll i'll share that clip with the students in the the co-management class that i teach because i i agree with you there are people that are open-minded and often see it as an inequity when there isn't proper public participation and it seems like some of the younger generation are a little bit in disbelief that it's even happening but but it's certainly been around and it's been this way for a while so maybe that would be a nice way to sort of end our conversation in today's podcast and If you have thoughts on the current developments in Canada in the context of Indigenous self-determination and empowerment and reconciliation in our country, where do you see things going that way? Well, I I see co-management and the ability to think differently and ability to not to blindly believe in in, uh, biological models, whether it's Newfoundland cod or whatever it is, keeping an open mind and also taking serious local observations. Labrador fishers were reporting disappearing cod long before or a couple of years before the cod crisis really hit, what, 1992? If their observations had been taken seriously, maybe we wouldn't have had the cod crisis. So it's not just a legal requirement, co-management. It's not just being nice to Indigenous people, reconciliation. It's opening up the society and opening up um, channels of communication. And certainly self-determination is part of that. Indigenous people have always asked for self-determination. And now they have this unique combination of still retaining a lot of their Indigenous knowledge, but at the same time, having a whole generation of well-educated Indigenous people who can express themselves and who can negotiate things. We saw the early evidence of that with the James Bay Northern Quebec Agreement, with the Inuit questioning the polar bear quotas and so on. But it's coming. And uh, so the future looks good, as far as I can see. I mean, there, there are a lot of reasons to be pessimistic, but I think there are more reasons to be optimistic. It's going to be very interesting times. 
Thanks. I think that's a good way to sum it up. When I read some of the literature sometimes that's more on the critical side of co-management, uh, I read it, but when you work and had to go to work in the field uh, of co-management, you don't have the privilege of burning the whole system down on a Monday. So I feel like we got to do our best to try to work with what we have and utilize it and and put it to good practice for the people that negotiated it and it is hard work and like you said there all there will always be problems to be working on it's not going away and that that kind of makes me chuckle about some of the first years i was involved in co-management because i think when our boards made their first recommendations the implementation plan that all the government people had put out said you'll make these recommendations and then you would be done but of course <laughs> after you make your first round of recommendations it's just really the beginning of uh, everything that had unfolded since uh, i don't know if you had any sort of final thoughts uh, that you might have wanted to capture today or not uh, well I, I think your summing up is 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 very good and very appropriate yeah it, it is a process and and we just have to work with it and then we can improve it too it's we, we don't have the last word on co-management well let me just say and i i certainly appreciate you taking your time to do this podcast with me today like i've met some of your students and they all do great work and publish excellent stuff so not everybody's going to get to be your student obviously but i think uh, by listening to this podcast there's certainly a lot that can be learned and in our show notes i'll be sure to include uh, links to a lot of your uh, different articles and stuff that we referenced today in the different books so thank you once again and uh, really wishing you uh, a uh, good health and a productive uh, 2024. So we'll be uh, we'll be watching to see what comes next from the FAO report that you're working on. Thank you, Jamie. Thank you for having me. It's been a very interesting discussion. All right, you take care. Bye bye.